we're live. Okay. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is a CBI webinar to announce the start of the public consultation for our shipping criteria. And on the line today, we have Sean Kidney from CEO, Tristan Smith from UCL, Matteo Begoni from CBI, and myself uh, hosting today's conversation. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes, keep yourselves on mute. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A forum and we'll try to get to as many as those as possible. Um, and so let me just get now into the agenda. And before we do that, very quickly, a big thank you to both Sophie Parker and Tristan Smith from UCL, who were absolutely instrumental to making sure that we were able to push forward the Scripshire criteria. So, with that, um, just a quick outline of how we're going to start. We'll have Sean very quickly talk about shipping and green finance and the nexus of these two things, followed by Tristan giving a quick update on the criteria themselves. Mateo will finish with a few words on how CBI's certification process works. And then we'll dive into some Q&A and I'll leave you with a few uh, bit of information on how the public consultation will work. So, uh, Sean, over to you. Thank you very much, Lionel. Uh, this is a, an important moment in the development of our taxonomy work. We're tackling an area of challenging transitions. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've been having a discussion about the need to move beyond the more straightforward sectors, let's call it the renewable energies of the world, even the energy efficiency, into areas where the pathways are not so available in terms of modal shift and where we're really going to have to start looking at how we uh, work harder to de decarbonize a challenging sector. This particular sector, the shipping sector, is equivalent to this being the sixth largest emitting nation in the world in terms of its emissions, 2.2% of global emissions. The worst thing, the scariest thing, is the growth in the sector could lead to up to 250% growth in emissions by 2050. Now that is a risk we cannot afford to take. We need to shift this relatively dirty sector into a sector which is low carbon as quickly as possible. Uh, that means we're going to have to reform the way we're powering our ships and various other measures. So the background behind all of this is that we've got a green bond market that is approaching about trillion dollars outstanding now. We have some significant developments which are going to fuel this market coming forward. We have, for example, in Europe, the European taxonomy, which is now formal regulatory guidance for what can be called green in the European market. And we have the European Green Bond Standard, which is uh, similar to the European, I should say, the Green Bond Principles and the Climate Bond Standard, coming into force as a regulatory instrument in Europe. But not only that, in many countries around the world, central banks and regulators have taken steps to encourage and build green finance markets. The People's Bank of China first but has now have a robust regulatory regime, which means that China's the uh, second largest green bond market in the world. We have similar measures in ASEAN with the regulators, the securities regulators there, and beginning to appear in different countries in Africa and Latin America. Of course, we're in the middle of a crisis now. Will all of this survive the crisis or are we going to abandon our attempts to try and green our planet. We need to understand a couple of things about this crisis. This is a crisis rooted in environmental degradation, as we're seeing in a number of very interesting papers published in the last few weeks, when in ecosystems degrade, pathogens jump between species, which is what we've seen now. We can now look at this and we can start thinking, ah, this is how climate change manifests itself, as the IPCC Health Committee has been telling us for 30 years is going to happen. They've been predicting a century of pandemics as a result of the, the volatile climate change we're going to experience. Now, whether this is specifically as a result of emissions put in the atmosphere on a certain date is an entirely different issue. But one thing we can say with great certainty is that managing our environment sustainably is a critical factor in being able to address the risks that we face and are experiencing right now. We need to make sure that as we rebuild, as we recover from this economy, we are doing two things. Clearly, 
we have a visceral understanding of what resilience means now. It means deepening our health systems, ensuring our social protections in place, so the next time we have one of these shocks, we are prepared to support the poor, the people who aren't able to go to hospital because they can't afford it. We know we need to make sure that our supply chains are resilient because things get frozen. A whole lot of industry is stopped, not just because workers aren't working, but because they can't get access to critical goods. And we need to make sure our food system is resilient, which is gonna require much more active collaboration between countries to ensure that when India stops, blocks exports of rice, as it has, that doesn't have a flow on effect of famines in other parts of the world. We're gonna to have to sort this out in the next three months. On the other side, we have to inoculate against the risk of catastrophic shocks. The IPCC in its 1.5 degree report essentially said, we will have climate change. It is happening right now. We are going to have a century of shocks from fire, from flood, from storms, from pandemics. That's given. What we're in a race now is a, a race against catastrophic change where we have no chance of being able to bounce back easily if we, achieve, if we get to four to five to six degrees warming. That's what this is about. Shipping is part of that inoculation against a future of catastrophic climate change. It's not the only sector, it's one of many sectors. We have to tackle steel, we have to tackle vehicles, which we are, we have to tackle energy, which we are, we have to tackle chemicals and plastics and so on. There's a lot of areas, but we can't do it without tackling shipping. This is why this webinar is so important and why these criteria are so important. I'm gonna now turn you over to Lionel and Tristan. I just wanna add something about Tristan, by the way, to, um, to connect some dots. Tristan's also be, led the third International Maritime Organization, GHG study, and co-chairs the World Bank's uh, Maritime Thread. I say that because there's a lot of conversations going on here, here, and here. We've attributed together in particular piece of work and uh, Tristan's been the linchpin of this. Thank you for all the work you've done. Lionel, over to you. Sorry, I had myself on mute. So thank you, Sean. Um, I'll just let Tristan explain basically how these criteria work and how they were developed. And he'll hopefully he'll be able to deal with any technical questions and comments that you might have. So Tristan. Thank you, Lionel. So um, what you're hearing today is the culmination of about um, 15 months of effort to draft um, a set of, of criteria that could be used in order to guide climate um, risk resilience and adaptation appropriate bond investment. Um, this diagram that's on the slide that you can see in front of you at the moment outlines the process that we went through. So starting with a scoping document that was circulated to two groups, a technical working group and an industry working group, who considered uh, that document and discussed its details in a sort of linear fashion. We started with the foundations of the document in the early months of last year and the principles and then gradually moved on to some of the more detailed technical discussions, particularly around metrics. And then as a result of all the conversations that went on, um, sorry, previous slide, please. As a result of all the previous conversations that went on, uh, those culminated in a set of criteria um, which, have, which contain all that, that discussion in their refinement um, relative to the scoping document that was drafted at the beginning of the process. It was um, a very rigorous process and had significant technical discussions, which I'll try and reflect on as we go through um, the judgments and decisions that were um, made in order to produce the criteria. Thank you. Um, the first step is to outline what the scope of these criteria include. Um, and the first is to explain what shipping is, in case it's not obvious, but uh, we have used a scope that is derived from the third IMO greenhouse gas inventory of, of what constitutes international ships, i.e. vessels which are propelled. And so that does necessarily exclude some of the floating assets that exist, um, which do not have propulsion mechanisms. Um, the uh, exclusion in the scope is of dedicated fossil fuel carriers, um, LNG tankers in particular and crude carriers and this deserves a bit of explanation because I know it's it's a counterintuitive conclusion to many people the the criteria are partly about mitigation but also about risk um, risk from the perspective of an, an investor in an asset being confident that there are not climate related risks to the 
valuation of that asset. And um, the exclusion of fossil fuel carriers is because these criteria are intended to be entirely consistent with a decarbonisation trajectory which would avoid the dangerous and catastrophic climate change that Sean has identified as, as a major societal risk. And under those decarbonisation trajectories, we know that we will be very likely to be rapidly reducing our consumption of fossil fuels globally, and therefore the demand for vehicles that are specialised in the transportation of fossil fuels, and that includes both LNG tankers and crude oil tankers. The exceptions um, that are notable here are the bulk carriers, which are currently carrying significant proportions of the global demand for coal. However, these are a fleet of ships which are also um, able to carry many other different commodities, um, notably iron ore and grains, um, and those commodities are not necessarily likely to decline. In fact, the grains in particular are likely to increase over the same time period. And as a result, there are substitution commodities that would make that fleet more resilient to climate risk. So I think, I, I'm sorry for spending a bit of time on it, but I think these are important justifications um, for why those vessel types that are very specifically identified have been excluded. The scope does include, however, the infrastructure, um, in particular, very closely related to the shipping sector. So the installation in ports of bunkering infrastructure and capacity in order to meet the system transition that the shipping industry is going to go through as it moves away from the use of fossil fuels. And uh, the final point is the scope on the emissions, much to the frustration of myself and I would say the, the membership of the technical working group, the scope does not include the life cycle emissions associated with the upstream production of energy commodities. This is a necessary constraint, unfortunately, at this present point, because the frameworks and the regulatory um, structures that would be necessary for those to be included are not present um, today, um, but we expect them to be very soon and hope that's something that might be addressed in a, in a future revision. Next slide, please. Um, I now need to explain the derivation of the guiding sort of decarbonisation trajectory or concept that is behind these principles. And I'm going to start by sharing some of the information from our interpretation of the IMO's initial greenhouse gas strategy, um, greenhouse gas reduction strategy. The blue curve on this plot, um, sorry, to start, I just want to explain the graph. It's a trend of carbon intensity on the y-axis, not emissions, carbon intensity over the time period to 2100. The blue curve um, is the trajectory for business as usual if no further policy is applied. The yellow curve represents the IMO's levels of ambition around carbon intensity and the family of curves, um, red, purple and green, represent the um, trajectory for carbon intensity as a result of um, the third level of ambition which is associated with at least 50% reduction in 2050 and associated with that third level of ambition is, is often omitted is language about trajectory reductions consistent and coherent with the Paris Agreement and the temperature goals in that Paris Agreement which is why we go beyond that minimum lower bound value of 50% you can immediately see there's an incoherency between the carbon intensity targets for the sector and the absolute reduction targets. And for that reason, it's the absolute reduction targets which naturally align more with the Paris Agreement temperature goals, which are used as the framing for the trajectory in this set of criteria. Next slide, please. The, um, the broad sort of framing is then translated into a very idealized trajectory. Um, with an upper and lower bound um, represented again by that third level of ambition statement in the IMO's initial reduction in greenhouse gas, um, uh, initial strategy on reduction of greenhouse gases. And um, in particular, we spent a lot of time in the technical working group discussing the alignment between the lower bound ambition of 50% and the Paris Agreement temperature goals and found it to be um, inconsistent um, with a proportionate response from the shipping industry and the increasing stringency that was evident when the IPCC published its 1.5 um, degree um, report in uh, later in the year 2018 after the development of the IMO's initial greenhouse gas reduction strategy. And for that reason, we've framed everything from this point forwards on the 100% reduction 
um, rate curve, which is illustrated in this graph. Next slide, please. Um, the, the translation of that into a carbon intensity trajectory is not trivial because it involves an estimation in, in some ways of the evolution of the transport demand over this period. The, the emissions and the intensity, which is the grams of CO2 emitted for each unit of transport supply, are related um, by that uh, transport demand that drives then the carbon intensity trend. However, for the purpose of simplification, we have made a straight line connection between our estimate of the most recent value of the fleet's average carbon intensity, which is obtained from the third IMO greenhouse gas study that reported to 2012, and the value that we identify as needed in 2050 to be consistent with the Paris Agreement, and that is the 2050 zero level of carbon intensity as an average across the shipping fleet. And there is no um, attempt to try and second guess how transport demand might evolve over this period. It's a simple linear reduction. Um, and I'm going to move to um, just emphasize that, sorry, I've got too many smaller windows open on my screen at the moment, but um, I just wanted to emphasize that, that there will be a discussion on the next slide about whether we can use um, AER or other metrics, but uh, we've framed this on an equivalency. So we take into account utilization of the fleet, um, which is derived for the carbon intensity trend you can see on the plot on this slide. Next slide, please. The metrics um, discussion is one where the question that we were debating was what is the most effective way to represent the um, way that we look at a carbon intensity trend across ship types. This is a subject which has had much discussion at the IMO that we've been heavily involved in ourselves as a research group. Um, and it's very contentious because of the way that different ship types get relatively rewarded or not by different metrics, depending on the nature of their operation and cargo carriage in particular. We are also constrained here by the data availability and the verification um, of that data. And um, that is significantly influenced by the IMO's data collection systems design, design, pardon me, and led us to a short list of only two metrics, the annual efficiency ratio, which is calculated as a function of a ship's actual capacity and distance sailed, and the operational indicator um, EEOI, which is inclusive of the actual cargo carried by a ship. There was a strong preference across all of the technical working group to use the EEOI wherever possible, and um, uh, because of its greater accuracy in representing the true carbon intensity or the true um, societal value of shipping relative to its fuel consumption and emissions. And so this is the metric which we prefer, but we recognize, especially from a validation and verification perspective, that for many ships, um, it will not be possible to do that. And we allow where that is the case, the substitution of a, of a less accurate metric, the annual efficiency ratio, AER. Next slide, please. Tristan, can I ask you a quick question um, about that? You have the prerogative. This is a technology agnostic um, threshold, very critical principle, uh, which is in line with how the European taxonomy has done its work. Uh, so essentially any kind of fuel can be assessed this, because we've had a couple of questions about biofuels, for example. It sort of doesn't matter, does it? Like, so what counts is more that the, you meet the overall efficiency measures so you can do anything you can use sail sailing ships will fit out of this easily for the nature of the measure etc etc have i understood correctly you have um but the challenge here is the life cycle emissions framing and right. perhaps we can have a bit more discussion of that on in the q a because there are some options which will be flattered by a life cycle emissions framing and some which will not be flattered when you just take an operational emissions framing um, and biofuel is the notable example here because um, it will it will be counted in a different way depending on what you consider about what's happened upstream. 
Got but it, besides that framing, yes, this is entirely technology agnostic. It's entirely about saying your objective is to meet a carbon intensity, a greenhouse gas intensity reduction, and um, and to achieve that through whatever means, uh, fuel, technology, or operational that is appropriate for your particular vessel type and investment. Got it. Thank you. The um, so the graph here illustrates. In a very clumsy way, I'm sorry, this is a graph that I produced and therefore is a, by nature a poor quality sketch. Um, a representation of, of what this might mean in practical terms for shipping investments. What we saw in the previous graphs were, were decarbonisation to zero by 2050, which is only three decades from here, and consistent with approximately the economic life of many shipping assets, in particular infrastructure, but also the fleet, which a new build ship, for example, built in 2020 or the early 2020s might well be expected to still be in operation during the 2040s and hopefully to 2050. The difference here is that the bond tenor, uh, the period over which the ship might be financed by a climate bond, is normally significantly shorter than the ship's economic life. And so we are in a situation here where we're specifying an objective um, which will have very significant implications after the period of the bond tenor. Um, during which the compliance and the, and the verification of the standard is being assessed. And there are approximately, if we step outside of that financial period for a second, over the, over the life of, of an asset, we can imagine at least three different pathways. One is um, what we've called managed decarbonisation, which is the, the blue trajectory of decreasing carbon equivalent intensity over the years, um, where gradually a fuel is blended in um, for allowing ship operation or the vessel's speed is reduced or a progressive energy efficiency fit or some combination of all of these things is used to just retain um, the lowest difference between the compliance requirement and carbon intensity and your ship's actual carbon intensity. Another approach would be to build um, a very efficient ship or very low carbon intensity ship today um, with whatever the most, the most um, high performing um, fuels might be um, but recognize that those might still be fossil fuels and therefore that the asset will require a significant retrofit at some point in its future. And in, for illustrative purposes, we're estimating that to be around the 10, 15 years point, which is consistent with a lot of the other work we're doing in forums like the Global Maritime Forum, the Getting to Zero Initiative, where we expect zero emission ships to be the very significant part of the new build fleet from 2030 onwards. And the third way to complying with this is to, is to just build a zero emission ship today and continue to own and operate that asset with zero emissions operations throughout its economic life. That's clearly the, the simplest way forwards, but it presents competitiveness challenges in the short term, given the lack of regulation to drive that um, for some of the fleets and may not be justifiable, hence the discussion about the alternative ways. And uh, there is significant um, content within the criteria that is trying to protect against the risk that an asset is invested in for the short term period of the bond tenor uh, disingenuously. That is to say that um, it's an asset which might need managed decarbonisation or major refit, but once the climate bond period has expired and there's no longer any uh, verification of that status, um, the asset is then reverted to a mode where it continues to use a fossil fuel, um, but without any, any reduction in carbon intensity, therefore exceeding the, the required trajectory. Next slide, please. Um, just to reiterate the point that Sean brought up on a couple of slides earlier, um, there are a number of different ways to meet those carbon intensity requirements. One is to, is to find ways to increase the energy efficiency of the asset over time um, or from this point forwards. And a number of areas are well known in the sector and many are already being adopted. Um, the general um, consensus in the literature is that those will get some reduction in carbon intensity but would not be sufficient and that's the main explanation for the most important area um, of, of options for, ship, for ships to meet these criteria which is um, to enable a fuel switch or alternatively an exhaust emissions capture and that could be for a number of different consumers on the vessel the main auxiliary and boilers to move towards uh, non-fossil fuels either wholly or incrementally using blends or mixtures of fuels over the course of a year um, for modifications to fuel storage and handling 
equipment on board for significant electrification um, for use in conjunction with the source of low carbon electricity and there will be some ship types that can wholly electrify but we do not expect that to necessarily be the most competitive solution for much of the ocean going um, deep sea shipping fleet. Um, there are lots of opportunities for capture and use on board of renewable energy with wind getting notable attention but solar and to some extent wave also being explored and um, there is the uh, black swan perhaps of capturing um, emissions on board the vessel and storing that for permanent sequestration um, uh, in, in due course similar to the to the equivalent on land. Next slide please. Um, so this refers to a comment I made earlier on the on this on the slide with the um, very poor quality sketch by me of, of what the practical implications are of the climate bonds uh, to a, an investment in a shipping asset which might have a life an economic life far beyond the period of the tenor and that's a requirement if you're using um, managed decarbonisation or major refit i.e an asset which will not at the beginning of its life be expected to remain below the compliance threshold throughout its life if that is the case then you're required to also submit a managed reduction plan um, and that uh, that is a description of what steps are expected to be taken including after the period of the bonds tenor in order to ensure that ship will remain in compliance with the trajectory um, that cannot at the moment um, use all fuel options that might be available in order to justify that future and that was a discussion extensively undertaken with the technical working group to identify um, what the com competitiveness and therefore the risk was especially of synthetic um, hydrocarbons so for example it isn't at this stage possible um, according to these criteria to specify that your ship will convert to run on synthetic um, methane or um, biomethane produced from waste or from food crops um, after the period that it needs a major retrofit to move away from LNG use. Um, similarly, you cannot specify at the moment in these criteria in the managed reduction plan that you would use a synthetic uh, diesel or a synthetic fuel oil equivalent um, or a bio variant of those if those have been produced using generation one or generation two biofuels. The only type of biofuel that is eligible in the managed reduction plan is advanced biofuel. Um, and then alternative synthetic fuels are hydrogen and ammonia with electrification of batteries, nuclear and wind being other options. Nuclear is a good one for lots of further discussion in the Q&A section if those um, are interested. We decided primarily that we couldn't rule it out um, given the evidence of the existing fleet which is extensively using nuclear in the icebreaker um, and warship categories and therefore this is proven technology and in certain circumstances it would be difficult to justify why that would not be included as as a propulsion technology on the evidence of that existing use. Tristan is it fair to say that some of this is a, a developing territory and that we may need to re-examine in the future? Yes that's a really good caveat and thank you for bringing it up it's um this is a very rapidly emerging space uh, the fuels the future fuels discussion as I'm sure many on the call will know and um, there remains high uncertainty about exactly what the most competitive options will be a lot of our justification for not including synthetic hydrocarbons at this point is because whilst these might be technically possible they do at this stage indicate that they would be not competitive to hydrogen and ammonia um, and therefore uh, very hard to justify including from the risk perspective but as evidence matures from tests both with which may prove that hydrogen and ammonia are not competitive for other reasons um, then we may find that we start to include synthetic hydrocarbons but at this stage there isn't evidence that supports that and if if listeners are concerned about the hydrogen aspect um, you'll note in the eu taxonomy there's quite a long discussion about hydrogen and we'll we're planning to do a webinar mid-year on the potential for green hydrogen and blue hydrogen uh, going forward as a way of um, addressing our uh, energy requirements and multiple sectors with shipping part of it. The main thing is we think volume supply will be available at a competitive price going forward. But stay tuned for that webinar as a separate discussion. Yes, exactly. This is a really difficult part of the whole of shipping's decarbonisation, which is this is not um, primarily a problem for the fleet. 
in many ways it is a problem for the land side supply chains of the fuels that shipping will be reliant on in order to fulfill its decarbonization in the most cost effective way and the evolution of those supply chains is is incredibly immature at the moment but there are signs that it is going to change very rapidly over the decade and so we've had to take all of the evidence on that into consideration here and do our best effort to to estimate what the implications will be especially in the period from 2030 which is going to be so critical in our view for the for the transition in the industry so so the the very reason why we have decarbonization trajectories which are baselined today and and are gradually reducing means that you can continue to operate for this decade on a fossil fuel if you take several steps to ensure that you're also best in class from a carbon intensity perspective the point at which you would likely need to move away from fossil fuels um, will be in approximately a decade time and, and that is obviously by by necessity a very high uncertainty period um, but i would stress that this has been extensively considered within the technical working group it was a key component of the consideration next slide please the um the, the further details which would be required within that management reduction plan just to finish this component of the presentation are to do with the um estimated time period at which for that particular asset any significant fuel switch is expected the way that um the fuel might be stored on board and handled and modifications to machinery and some estimation of total additional cost um, which is going to have to include some estimate of the um, fuel price that might be associated with what is being proposed all of this is highly uncertain there is no there's no good way to do a quality assurance of that process so we are relying on the principle of transparency that it is for the market to describe what their plans are and for and for those making investment decisions to do whatever they think is appropriate to assess the the reliability of these reduction plans in protecting that asset against significant risks associated with further regulation particularly of shipping um, and so this is this is something that might be again revisited if there are greater um, sources of information and evidence in the future but the best approach that we could identify at this point was transparency and a very well specified managed, managed reduction plan next slide please so the summary uh, in a very simple flowchart of what I've probably made sound far more complicated than it actually is, um, is given by this excellent sketch by Lionel and highlights his much greater skills than me at producing visually engaging information. Um, the, the key question is, is the vessel dedicated to trans transporting fossil fuels? Um, there is no blanket exception on this, except um, in the case of crude oil tankers and liquid gas ca carriers as announced on the earlier slide but other vessels which are anticipated at design stage to be solely transporting fossil fuels throughout their economic life would be um, also excluded so that's the yes no criterion at the top is the vessel zero emissions at the point of build and, op and operation as soon as it's launched if it's yes that's very straightforward it's immediately certifiable if it isn't then the vessel will remain under the emissions intensity threshold so um, we will need to evaluate that and as long as that is projected to be the case and assessed to be the case throughout the period of the bond tenor then the vessel is certifiable and then as we just discussed um, if the vessel is operating under um, the emissions intensity threshold then it will also require a managed reduction plan including after the period of the bond tenor to demonstrate how it will remain in compliance with that emissions trajectory next slide please um i think this is over to you okay yeah great uh thanks tristan there's a lot of information and we do have quite a lot of questions coming up but before we get into the q a section i just want to give Matteo Bigoni from CBI an opportunity to speak about how CBI's certification scheme actually works for those of you, and I'm sure many of you are now interested in certifying your debt instruments against these criteria. So Matteo, if you're on the line, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning and good afternoon everybody and thank you Lionel. So my name is Matteo and I'm head of certification here at Climate Bonds Initiative in London. Um, and I'm part of the uh, Climate Bond Standard and Certification team, uh, together with Lionel. Um, and my job is basically to apply the criteria 
that Tristan and the rest of the TWG have put together um, in order to confirm that a bond is in compliance with the criteria and the climate bond standard. So the concept behind the certification scheme is that it acts like a fair trade labeling scheme. So when you go to the supermarket and for instance, you want to buy organic coffee, you trust uh, a label. So you go and select a product, a coffee, that is basically, uh, for instance, fair trade or organic. So you as a consumer trust the label, the organic or fair trade label, because you believe that the label gives credibility and robustness to your choice as a consumer. You trust the label because somebody else behind the label has conducted a due diligence process to assess that the product, in this case, for instance, coffee, is organic or fair trade. So similarly, uh, our certification scheme operates that way. We conduct a due diligence process um, in order to make sure that the consumer in this play, in this case, uh, an investor, trust the climate bonds label in order to believe that the project and assets underlying the bond are in fact in compliance with the 2050 zero carbon future in line with the Paris Agreement. So the certification scheme looks at providing investors with a product that is in compliance with the 2050 zero carbon future as Tristan described in the process of describing the decarbonization trajectory for the shipping sector. And so the uh, certification scheme is widely used worldwide for issues to provide investors with a reliable product. And it's basically relies on a confirmation that the bond is in compliance with two aspects. One is the climate bond standard, which basically talks about the use of proceeds of the bond and the, the reporting requirements. And two, the climate bond taxonomy and the sector by sector eligibility criteria, which in this case would be the shipping uh, technical criteria that Tristan just described. So the confirmation is provided by an external reviewer called a verifier, um, which has been approved by the Climate Bonds Initiative to provide verification services under the standard. And the verification basically is a process of external review where the um, emission intensity thresholds, for instance, are um, assessed in order to provide proof and evidence of compliance with the standard. Next slide, please. So the, these are the five main steps um, around which the certification scheme is articulated. But the three most important steps are number two, number four, and number five. So the most important, um, what well, the first uh, step in the process is pre-issuance certification. Pre-issuance certification, as the word says, is provided before the bond goes to market. So a verifier is engaged before the issuance of the bond in order to provide what we call a pre-issuance assurance report. They submitted to the Climate Bonds Initiative and that report provide confirmation that the underlying project and assets, in this case, for instance, ships, meets uh, the emission intensity, carbon intensity threshold described in these criteria. When certification, pre-issuance certification is awarded, the issuer can then go to market and to the roadshow with the climate bonds um, logo. Um, so they receive um, a marketing tool that they can be used in the um, uh, um, um, certification documents and the, um, the, the, the prospectus of the bond. So they can go onto the roadshow and tell their investors, here, look, this is my bond, is green, is in compliance with the climate bonds standard, and it provides clear climate benefits. The second step is post issuance um, a certification, which is awarded 12 months after the issuance of the bond. Um, Portage certification is mandatory under the climate bond standard and is a confirmation that the proceeds of the bond are being allocated correctly to the project and assets that pre issuance certification promised investors they would be allocated to. The um, position certification is mandatory under the climate bond standard, so it provides an excellent comfort to investors. 
the um, third step, main step, is basically what is this is slide number five, which is the annual report. And the annual report is provided annually, so once a year, throughout the lifetime of the bond, so until maturity. Um, and in this case, obviously, um, issuers have to provide an annual report every year throughout, the, um, throughout maturity, until maturity. So these are the three main steps. Um, I'm basically finished with the presentation. Um, any questions? Uh, Lionel, can I ask Matteo a question? Yes. Just confirm, under the European Green Bond Standard, mm -hmm. which is uh, obviously of critical importance to actors in the European market at this stage, uh, that references the taxonomy. But there yes. is a provision that stuff which isn't in the taxonomy and shipping is not currently in the EU taxonomy, even though we've talked about doing it next year. Yes. You can still issue a bond in the, in the, under the European Green Bond Standard for things like shipping. Is that correct, Matteo? Yes. So meeting the criteria under the Climate Bond Standard would be one of the ways to basically comply with European taxonomy and being able to basically claim the climate benefits listed under the EU taxonomy. Because at the moment, uh, given that, the, that there, there isn't a very specific description of what the shipping uh, sector would look like under the EU taxonomy, meeting these um, criteria would also meet, obviously, the objectives of the climate, um, the Paris Agreement, and so be in compliance with the, um, the EU taxonomy. So it would be left to the verifiers to basically opine on whether the bond is in compliance with the EU taxonomy. In this case, using the criteria is one of the tools to be in compliance with our 2050 zero carbon future. Thank you. Lionel. Okay, great. Thank you, Matteo. Um, so we'll get into the Q&A now. I originally had a question for one of our industry working group members Nina Alstrand. Um, we typically get questions about how are these shipping criteria, how do they fit into the wider context of shipping and green finance? And I thought, it, you know, who better to ask than someone who's actually in the field? Uh, I'm not sure if Nina is able to connect by audio though. Nina, are you there? Can you hear us? And can you log in? Give you a minute. Okay. We might get back to Nina in a bit. Um, there's been a flood of questions, and I think that we will probably start from the top. Um, well, I've got one from Roger, and that is, what if a tanker would carry biofuels, so gas or liquid, instead of the fossil fuel equivalent? Uh, Tristan? Yeah, and this uh, is not unrelated to a, a later question about product tankers and why they haven't been excluded as well. So. Um, from the discussions we had in the technical and industry groups, the assumption is that the volumes of bioenergy that might be shipped at, at, at the moment would be expected to be smaller and therefore more likely to be moved in those product tanker size ranges, the smaller ships, rather than the Afrosuez and VLCC carriers of crude oil. Um, it's very hard in the oil tanker fleet to make a very clear sort of break between what's carrying dirty cargoes of crude and cleaner cargoes of product but that is a broad split and it's a representative split of where the climate risk lies because the product fleet is more likely to be re-rolled as we go into a non-fossil centric economy um, to carrying the more complex products that are still needed in industrial processes uh, as well as some of the biofuel mix. If there is an argument that uh, a very large crude carrier is essentially going to become a very large biofuel carrier um, and be able to operate in that market consistently because there's so much biofuel volume being shipped around the world, contrary to what much of the discussion in the IPCC's more recent climate change and land use paper describes, then there may be a case that could be made and we'll have to review that evidence in due course. Great. Thank you, Tristan. Okay, it looks like we have figured our technical challenge and Nina is now able to join. Nina, over to you. Hi, Lionel. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, absolutely fine. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you for a great uh, presentation. Um, and, and sort of back to your question in, in, in terms of alignment and where we see this fit into to greater market development. So I, I definitely think that these criteria fulfill a 
very important role in the current developments where of course many are eager to promote sustainable investments but you're not always sure what is really sustainable how green is green enough uh, and of course for some sectors such as shipping it, it might be more tricky or difficult than than in other sectors and even though we we see great progress in terms of standardization currently with of course the eu taxonomy in the forefront um, but as we know it doesn't cover shipping or at least not yet and this standard with these criteria certainly creates a well-needed complement to the taxonomy uh, for this sector in particular and, and i think it also uses methodology that uh, that we could expect to see in in the taxonomy if it were to be covered in the future and um, also i think it's um it's uh, very important to see the clear linkage to the IMO's trajectories and, and thereby also the Poseidon principles. Um, and using sort of the same methodologies and metrics that we already have in the market, it creates further, or it enables further standardization. It also uh, creates more simplicity, which is certainly something we do need by using metrics that are already well known in the market. Uh, and I think it's also very important now that we see many standards emerging for different sectors in the, in the market. It's also good that we see cohesion between these standards and, and therefore I think it's very good to see that these criteria for shipping, they both complement but of course also then build on standards that we already have out there, which I think will, will provide great guidance both for, for issuers and investors going forward. That's great, Nina. Damn, I really appreciate the vote of confidence and I, I absolutely agree. Um, okay, we have another question from Sophia for Tristan as well, which is how much are we missing when life cycle emissions are not included? Um, and this, this is a really good question. And it's a really difficult topic to do justice in a very short answer. Um, so for the current fuels, they are predominantly about their operational emissions um, and that's one of the reasons why we ultimately concluded it was okay to take that operational emissions framing for now for the short term um, and that's because 90 percent plus of the of the greenhouse gases that are emitted come from the downstream process of combustion on board the vessel the the big problem that we have in the future is that the solutions we think that exist for for the for the fleet, um, in particular, the synthetic fuels derived from hydrogen can be produced with very high upstream emissions, or they can be produced with zero upstream emissions. And so, depending on the regulatory frameworks and the and the way that investments flow into that fuel supply chain, we will have either a very high upstream emission or not. And that needs, I think, as much um, control as possible. And as soon as we start to get to the point where the fleet is is increasingly moving to those solutions, then clearly that life cycle emissions framework needs to be in place. This particular discussion interacts very significantly with the debate at the IMO, which is only just kicking off on the subject of life cycle emissions accountancy. And um, there are a number of proposals that have yet to be discussed in detail, partly because of COVID-19 and the postponement of MEPC 75. Um, but that may well provide some framing that we can use here as well um to guide how how the bond um, might take into account the difficult subject um it's not a risk in the short term it becomes a big risk in the medium to long term i.e five to ten fifteen years time and and as soon as it becomes a risk i think we need to make sure those wider standards the isos the imo work is is mature and can be reliable because otherwise we're going to have a lot of unintended and perverse consequences and asset stranding risks um, so it's in everyone's interest to move to a rigorous life cycle framing as quickly as possible. Okay, great. Thanks, Tristan. And obviously another one for you. Um, and this one is from Cheryl on the types of promising technologies in terms of engines and fuels that we can... Is it just me that's lost, Lionel? We, we've lost you, Lionel, I'm afraid. I think I, I know the question because I can see it in the list. So far away, I can take over. Um, so the question is for shipment. Oh no, it's not that one. Sorry. 
are there promising technologies and in fuel we see that will be adopted in the mainstream to enable the shift to zero emission ships so and then the question goes on to say we see dual fuel engines which can easily switch from diesel to lng but these engines whilst better in terms of emissions output are still not zero emission and may have fossil fuel lock-in so i guess i would say two things one is those engines are not necessarily better um this is a sort of lng industry marketing trick where there's an assumption that lng as a solution is is better from a greenhouse gas perspective. It is better from a CO2 perspective, but often it's associated with significant methane emissions. Depending on the machinery chosen and those methane emissions can actually, in circumstances, produce higher greenhouse gas and climate impacts than burning an equivalent HFO or MDO fuel. Um, so I just wanted to first make this um, correction on the perception that LNG is automatically superior from a greenhouse gas perspective. It is not, um, but those, fleet of ships that are using dual fuel engines do give you a sign as to how the fleet might move to genuine um, lower carbon greenhouse gas emission options. Um, we in our work have, have studied this extensively over the years and this is going to be a shameless plug for some of the work we've been doing with one of the classification societies Lloyd's registered looking at um, future fuel pathways for the sector where we estimate the costs of all the different fuels and the total operating cost under different synthetic bio and alternatives to fossil fuels and estimate which are likely to be the most competitive. We then run that in lots of different scenario simulations to look how different portions of the fleet evolve over the next few decades. And I would say that consistently we're finding that ammonia as a fuel appears to be the most competitive option. Um, once we go to away from fossil fuels, primarily because of regulation, because the IMO will have to regulate if it's going to meet its absolute emissions reduction and that regulation will have to put push the sector away from fossil fuels at that point the most competitive fuel for most of the fleet appears to be ammonia the key component of that hypothesis is that the ammonia's uh, the ammonia's challenges in terms of um environmental and health impacts are manageable it's a it's a fuel which has got highly corrosive properties um and that raises safety issues which are already covered in the fact that we move approximately 15 million tons of ammonia around the world by by ship today um, so most um, evidence is indicating that that should be solvable but in the event that we cannot resolve the safety questions in the sort of finalized mature designs that come out in a few years time or there's some complication with its using combustion engines that hasn't been identified by the tests that have been undertaken already then we will see um, other variants being used instead. But this concept of having an internal combustion solution, which is dual fuel, as trialled and developed in the LNG fleet, looks likely to also be the way that ammonia could be used. There are already, according to one of the main engine manufacturers, MAN, about 3,000 ships, which could be easily retrofitted to burn ammonia, which shows that the existing two-stroke machinery is relatively adaptable. Um, and the newer engine designs or multi-fuel engine designs that are now being worked on to my understanding by all the main engine manufacturers will make that that internal combustion component of the ship incredibly versatile to a number of different fuels and then it will become a question as to which of them is the is the most economical to be used because no operator is going to want to be using a fuel that has a disadvantage from a total cost of operation perspective uh, tristan we've had quite a few comments about is this Paris Agreement a line? Can, you know, what does it mean? Clearly, there's a trajectory issue. We're trying to shift the whole industry. Uh, I just want to say there is demand for green bonds, massive demand, and for green finance out there, for investors worried about the future. And this is what this is meant to unleash, that ships that do qualify will get access to this preferential market for finance. But the concept is you're sort of qualifying today, but not tomorrow if you don't improve, right? It's a, it's a changing line. Can you just explain how this achieves the Paris Agreement and shipping or the Paris Agreement targets for the shipping sector again? Because we had a few readers asking this, this fundamental question. So the Paris Agreement targets themselves are a little ambiguous, partly well, because well, we have this, our, our interpretation of it. Yeah. <laughs> partly because of this wording of well below two and aiming for 1.5. Um, this does two things. It, it ensures that in the time frame that well below two and 1.5 is commonly being interpreted in, uh, i.e. we need to have zero emissions from all sectors that can credibly get to zero um, uh, by the middle of the century. That's that's a basic interpretation, which is 
applied in a lot of the government logic that goes into nationally determined contributions in the UNFCCC negotiations. And this is a standard that basically transitions any investment within class, classified by the climate bond portfolio to, to achieve that objective, which is more stringent than the IMO um, initial strategies um, ambition. And that's partly because that initial strategy is an initial strategy and will be revisited in 2023. And our estimation is that when it's revisited, it will increase in stringency. But that's clearly a political discussion, which is highly uncertain and has got no less uncertain because of the events of COVID-19. Um, but that's the climate science that says you need to be at that point by the middle of the century. But there's another component in the climate science, which is that the emissions from shipping in all sectors have a cumulative impact on the temperature rise. And so it doesn't matter um what happens just in 2050 it matters what happens from now onwards and in fact it mattered what happened 200 years ago onwards um, because all of the emissions we've already produced and will produce in the next three decades will contribute directly to temperature rise and the more we emit next decade will be significant to the temperature rise we ultimately experience and so we need to have a crash stop in greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors immediately if we're going to have any chance of avoiding the catastrophic climate change that Sean has referred to. And that is why the trajectories are immediately um, turning to a downwards trajectory from 20, the early 2020s onwards, which is the earliest that this could possibly hope to influence. Um, if you take any sort of climate science perspective, you would have wanted to have done this 30 years ago, but unfortunately we weren't mature enough to do it then. Thank you. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. I just uh, lost my connection earlier and I happen to have lost a lot of the questions. Um, so Tristan, is there anything else that you wanted to point out or Mateo or Sean? Uh, we have about five minutes left in this webinar. There's, um, there's one question that I've lost the, sorry, <laughs> I've lost the name of the person who asked it. I'm, it's really difficult to keep track just of. Just go for it anyway. Just so. so the question is, uh, for ship lenders not doing project finance, i.e. one loan to one to two ships, but corporate lending with a dynamic fleet of ships, could you elaborate due to the managed decarbonisation plan how to meet trajectory? And this is, a, this is a really interesting question because obviously we based all of this discussion in the, in the slides around individual vessels. I would say that you can, you can use this for a portfolio approach. So you could ask the owner or the entity, the stakeholder that you're considering a project, um, sorry, not, you're considering a corporate lend, lending action to to evaluate all of its fleet and demonstrate how all of its fleet would be in aggregate below that decarbonisation threshold. And that is exactly the principle behind the Poseidon principles, which requires banks to understand as a portfolio how their aggregate fleet is performing below the trajectory. And, that, and in many ways, that's a, that's a useful uh, technique to use because uh, there are challenges with decarbonising individual ships it might be more expensive to retrofit and be uncompetitive and the market might want to offload those assets rather than um, either to the second-hand market or to the scrappage premature scrappage at the point when zero emission ships become available that presents other problems but i don't see it preventing the way that we've designed this from being applied at a firm level and i hope that answers that question um, if you want more guidance i recommend looking at the method in the in the poseidon principles and maybe there's an argument for a climate bond uh, clarification on that point in due course okay great so we're reaching the end of this presentation and just before i let everybody go um then the webinar would be complete without a call to action. So I have just one last slide, which is basically to ask everyone who's joined to fill out the public consultation form, which you can find on our website June 26th. We really like to hear from everybody, um, you know, your thoughts on how this works, what works and what doesn't, and how we can improve these criteria and make sure that they work. So the links are below. Um, and you can find us on our website, climatebonds.net. And I look forward to hearing from everyone. So, Lionel, thank you. Say, Lionel, can I just say a couple of words to, to finish? There's a lot of discussion globally about what's in, what's out when it comes to green. What you can be certain of is that the investor demand now, as a result of the growing appreciation of risks of climate change for sustainable instruments like this, is very strong. We hope to use this particular shipping criteria to open up that demand into the shipping sector. 
we have seen a lot of interest already. So this is a way of bringing shipping as a transition sector into a story where it has not been part of the story so much in the past. We have seen a couple of interesting bonds, notably from NYK, who served on the industry working group on this, that, that showed how this could work going forward. It's not necessarily simple. This is not meant to be guidance for ordinary citizens in the streets. This is meant to be guidance for shipping owners and their consultants to be able to address the issues. From the ordinary citizens in the streets, what we're doing here is showing the pathway for shipping to net zero carbon. That's the point. If you fit within that pathway, you're in, you can issue green bonds, you can issue sustainable bonds, and you can do it with the new European green bond standard, not just under the current bond standard. Bear that in mind. This is consistent with the European taxonomy and green bond standard. It is not separated. And this work we brought into the European taxonomy next year. The opportunity is extraordinary. This has become a trillion dollar market very, very quickly. It is continuing to grow even during the crisis. We saw Iberdrola issue a 750 million euro bond a few weeks ago for 11 and a half times over subscription. So get to it and of course, get to it on the fleets. That's the uh, opportunity for us. It is a huge part of global emissions. We have to make shipping work for us if we're gonna have a sustainable future for our children. All right, great. So thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Sean, thank you, Tristan and Matteo. And yes, I'm looking forward to feeding, getting the feedback. So have a good day. All right, thank bye. you. Bye bye.